All right, element notation. All right, so the symbols that we typically use to represent the element in full uh, in the full context are as follows. You have this big X right here, that meant to represent the symbol of the element in question. Now the element of the symbol absolutely depends on the identity of Z. Z, the subscript value here on the left side, is the atomic number of the element. And whatever the atomic number of the element is, automatically dictates the identity of the element. And vice versa, the moment you know the identity of the element, automatically you have the atomic number. Mind you, you still have a periodic table, or you have to use a periodic table to you know, see what you're dealing with in terms of the atomic number and the element. But because it is understood that you will have access to periodic table, knowing the atomic number is the same as knowing the element symbol that you're dealing with. All right, now the superscript in this uh, notation is the mass number. This tells you the mass of the specific element. And in simple terms is the summation of the proton and the neutron, since they are so much more massive than the electrons, they pretty much dictate the mass of the entire atom. All right, so let's take a look at helium. If we're dealing with helium-4 in particular, what this tells you is that you have, first of all, a set number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Now, the fact that we're dealing with helium-4 in particular will give us the number of, of neutrons present in here, but the atomic number, the atomic number is automatically equal to the number of protons. So once you know what element you're dealing with, simply look up its atomic number, that's the number of protons the element possesses. The number of neutrons is simply determined by the difference between the mass number and the atomic number, because after all, the mass number is protons plus neutrons. Subtract the number of protons from the mass number, automatically you are left over with just the number of neutrons. So in this case, we have four minus two, which is in other words, two neutrons. And the number of electrons, if the element has no charge written on it, the number of electrons is equal to the number of protons. All right, let's take a look at another example. Uh, this time we look at rubidium, uh, which has atomic number 37, and the atomic mass is roughly 85. All right, so if we're dealing with rubidium 85, well, we know uh, right out of the gate, because this is rubidium, atomic number has to be 37. And if the atomic number is 37, that tells us that we have 37 protons automatically. The number of neutrons, once more, is the atomic mass minus the atomic number. So we have 85 minus 37, which is equal to 48. So we have 48 neutrons. And now for the electrons, notice that now we have a charge written for the element. The way we determine the number of electrons is simply by subtracting the charge of the element from the atomic number. So in other words, 37 minus plus 1 is equal to 36 electrons. All right, let's do one more example. Let's take a look at carbon, which has an atomic number of six, a mass of about 12. If we look at carbon 13 in particular, uh, because the element is carbon, the atomic number is six. Since the atomic number is six, automatically we have six protons. The number of neutrons is simply determined by subtracting the mass number with the atomic numbers. So we have 30 minus six, which is seven, so we have seven neutrons. And the number of electrons is once again, the atomic number minus the charge, which is the same thing as saying six minus minus three, which is the same thing as six plus three. And six plus three is nine, so this tells you that you have nine electrons in this particular system. Now, by the way, when your element does have a charge, we do refer to them as ions, and we're gonna I'm actually going to do more than imply. We're actually going to get into how you name ions and how you name molecules that contain ions in the next lecture. All right, but now that we have introduced the idea that the mass number is associated with protons plus neutrons and the fact that it's only the number of protons that determines the element, well, here comes a new nugget of information. Specifically, that you can change the number of neutrons in an element and not change the identity of the element. And so this is one of the aspects that Dalton kind of got wrong. He said that atoms of the same element, they have the same mass. Turns out they do not. 
because the atom, the element, only depends on the number of protons that it has. That has to remain constant. But the number of neutrons do not need to remain constant. So you could actually have, and we do have, for a vast number of elements in the periodic table, different mass numbers for the same element. Uh, one example uh, shown here is boron. Boron, which has an element uh, atomic number of 5, meaning that you only have 5 protons in the element, can exist as boron 10 or boron 11. And as far as the number of protons go, each one of those two counterparts, which we refer to as isotopes, uh, have 5 protons. They have to because they're both boron. The number of neutrons, however, is where the story changes. 10 minus 5 will tell you that you have 5 neutrons, and 11 minus 5 will tell you that you have 6 neutrons on the heavier version of the element. Now, since they're both neutral, this tells you that you have the same number of electrons as you do have protons, 5 in each case. Alright, so as I was mentioning earlier, the elements do have many different kinds of isotopes. And the atomic masses that we see in the table, the big reason that they have all these decimals is because the atomic masses are actually average values of the different isotopes that each element possesses. So for instance, let's take a look at the P block right here. If we expand and zoom in in that region, specifically to look at how many isotopes each element has, we find out that some of them have a huge deal of different isotopes. Uh, first of all, uh, let's highlight the fact that some of the elements do only have one natural isotope present, like fluorine, phosphorus, arsenic, aluminum, and iodine. They only have one isotope present, naturally. Other isotopes, like boron, carbon, nitrogen, and even tossing in oxygen in there, they only have like two main isotopes available to them, which are natural. And then other elements still, like tin, they can have 10 stable natural isotopes present in any batch of tin. Tellurium, germanium, selenium, same idea. They have a lot of elements of relatively good contributions in terms of the abundances. And so, as I was saying earlier, the atomic mass of the element is actually the average mass based on the different natural isotopes that the element possesses and the abundance of those elements accounted for. Now the mass, the atomic mass is given by this formula, which is the summation of the isotope mass times something I call the ratio. And the ratio is simply the abundance percentage divided by 100%. Alright, so to give you an example, looking back at boron, which has isotope boron 10 and isotope boron 11, uh, the abundances are 20% for boron 10 and 80% for boron 11. So what we do to find out the atomic mass of boron is to multiply the isotopic mass of boron 10 by its percentage divided by 100, so 20% divided by 100, so that gives you the 0.20, plus the isotopic mass of boron 11 times its percentage, 80%, divided by 100, so we end up with 0.8. And right here what you have to do is actually input the isotopic masses of boron 10 and boron 11, which is something I will have to provide you with. Because as you can see right here, the values have a lot of digits. Uh, they are very precise and very accurate due to the instrumentation that allows its measurements. And these are numbers I wouldn't expect you to memorize, by the way. So I have to provide you with those numbers. So the atomic mass, what you do is you multiply the isotopic mass of boron 10 by its ratio. You do the same thing for boron 11, isotopic mass times its ratio, carry out those multiplications, and then add the two numbers together. And together, they give you the atomic mass of boron, 10.81, which if you look at the periodic table, you realize that's pretty much what you have there. All right, so all of this concludes the lecture that it was meant to prep you up in terms of the different laws, the different principles, the story of the elements in the periodic table, and the idea that each element possesses isotopes. In the next lecture, I will discuss with you how to name the various elements, the various compounds that you could actually prepare, handle, and study in this class. So I'll see you in the next lecture.